Good morning and welcome to worship on this 23rd day of July 2023, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets you in this and in every season, and whose work for you never fails, whose promise for you is sure. Amen. Gathered together this morning, let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have hoarded your bounty, and so in the name of Jesus we ask that you would forgive us and that you would grant us your great mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest, we have lacked the courage to speak, we have spoken falsely. So in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when you thirst. God offers you boundless grace when you fail. So claim the gift of God's great mercy, which is for you. You are free and you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the weed into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. What anyone with ears, listen, the gospel of the Lord. So to me, what we have here is a parable about awareness. It is about the wherewithal God grants us. Or to come at it the other way, the way the parable actually does, this is a story about how easily distracted or waylaid I am and you are. 
And my question is, is if you see that here. In this text, do you see that? That this is about how easily distracted or waylaid we are. In the parable, an unspecified, and that's important that it's unspecified enemy, comes into the kingdom of heaven field. He sows weeds amongst the wheat God has planted. And then he just slinks back to his lair of nefariousness. He's fairly impotent in the story. I'm thinking of this like Skeletor from He-Man. I can't help it. I remember that cartoon and that's what I'm picturing here. Kind of goofy and basically impotent. As the story progresses, all the plants come up as plants are wont to do. And all the ones that are supposed to bear grain do indeed bear this grain. But then some of the residents come along, the witnesses to all this stuff. And from what they can see, and then from all that they can care about, the story becomes all about the weeds. Kingdom of Heaven Field has this manager, God, who tries to be obscurely clear, foggily transparent, and he speaks. He says, you know, it is, after all, an enemy, even an impotent one, but an enemy, that does this work. Which means enemies would, of course, tend to do the things to you that are against your best interest. They're antagonistic. This is what an enemy does. What's the deal with you? Back when I watched He-Man, and I have Skeletor that I'm picturing in this story, I would have maybe said, uh, no duh. You remember that? You remember that saying from years and years ago? If, if that's anything, no duh would be what this manager says. Enemies are by definition antagonistic. Why should we be surprised in the least by what this enemy has done? And here's the important part of this. Look at the process of this. It's in verse 28, where these residents and their awareness has been swiped from them. These residents, by this point, even after the manager of Kingdom of Heaven Field has spoken, they're still on it. They are utterly distracted, and they are falling for a trick by an entity that wants them to fall for the trick, that wants them to be distracted. Skeletor, as I picture this enemy being, for whatever reason, cannot get the seeds for the grain that God has planted. He-Man's planet is called Eternia. Skeletor cannot get the good seeds off the planet. But he's nefarious. He's antagonistic. That's what he does. So he distracts us from what's good. He is otherwise impotent. And what do we do? What do the residents, and what do I, and what do you do? We simply run with the distraction like it isn't a distraction. We fall for the deception, even if we know it's a deception. Even if we know it's by an enemy. Think about it like this. Last week we heard the parable that comes just before this. It is the parable of the sower. Do you know that one? you remember that one? That's maybe one of the most famous of all the parables. It was read last week, and it was part of worship. If you want to go back, it's just right ahead of this story. And in that story, this is where God is likened to the most careless, the most wanton farmer of all time. This guy has seed for days and days and days and eternities and eternities, and he can just throw it willy-nilly all over the place. Because God, this sower, has so much, God doesn't even worry about where it's all going. It can just be dispersed everywhere, and God isn't even worried about it. That's how abundant and deep and powerful God is. The thing here is waste all you want, I'll sow more. So wasteful is God the sower that only a quarter, if you remember that story, only a quarter of God's seed produces. Or I guess from God's perspective, even needs to produce for things to go well. Only a quarter. 
And then right on the heels of that, we get this parable. That's the parable for this week. And all of the seed in this story is doing well. There's a whole switch here, which we can't see because it seems to be about distraction and we get distracted so easily. But in this story, all of the seed is producing. This is a 75% increase. God is now batting 1,000. And the enemy, the enemy is so impotent that he, Skeletor or whatever he is, can't even hope to dig up. He can't even undo all the constructing. He's overwhelmed. He's defeated. All the creating is in process and God is at work. All of the sowing is at 100% from this wanton sower of a God. He can't do anything to change it. All he can do is hope that you don't notice it. And so this is quite a thing. What do the people in this parable whose lives and whose livelihood it literally is to live in kingdom of God feel? What do the people whose life it is to be and to have purpose, to connect and to work in this field and to thrive, what are they doing? What do they see and then what are they doing? They're not amongst this 75% increase, this 100% yield, they are not even just talking about the wonder of that. They are talking about the weeds. So to me, this is a parable about how easily distracted I can be. This is a parable about the waylaid ones by a pretty impotent enemy. So I've had the text on the screen. I've talked about it. Do you buy what I'm saying about it? Do you see that that seems to be what this parable is about? Are you with me? Can you see this? Besides the text I have here uh, to show you, a extremely low fidelity, definitely not high definition video clip. The video clip is called an awareness test. Since this to me is a parable about our awareness, since this to me is a parable about how easily distracted we can be by the craziest of things, I have this test. It's, it's sort of to, to build in us what awareness looks like or how this process works. If this parable is in any way what I'm saying it is, then the video clip is a way to sort of engage in, in a newfangled way the idea that's existed in the text. It's a way for us to fall into or experience it for ourselves. This is a way to look at the circumstances of this parable, to, to move towards the gist or the punchline, the moral awareness, and not being distracted. Don't be distracted by how, how low fidelity it is. I just want to show you this video. Ready? Here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Here they make it. The answer is 13. 13. Did you count but 13? Did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! But what about that? Did you see that? I mean, honestly, did you see the bear? It's easy, this video proclaims. This video is actually a kind of older English commercial about not running over bicyclists who are on the road with us, but it claims that it is easy to miss something you're not looking for, which seems to fit what I think this parable's about, if you buy that. It's easy to miss the wonder or the good or the grain 
it's easy to miss what would give us life and what is astonishing and building. And it's easy to miss this with all the distractions and all the noise and all the enemies and all the temptations and all the things we face. So to me, this parable is meant to be a wake-up call. It is meant to be an alarm. It is meant to be an awareness boost. God is doing, God has done, and God is doing great things in our lives, in the lives of others, in the midst of God's creation. And so the question here then is whether we see them, enjoy them, participate with them, become part of the lineage or the legacy of these good things, whether we enjoy who we are and the field that we occupy, or whether if instead we are too occupied or too distracted or too waylaid to do so. I'd like to think about it with you. I'd like for you to think about what distractions you face. And maybe this is a spot where we pause this video. What distractions do you face? If you need a minute to think about that, if you want to write those down or whatever you do to think into things, I want to ask you about what distractions you face. Ready? You have some? I've made my own list. I think it would be easy uh, to have the news playing, even in the background or even in the lobby of a waiting room, and to be distracted by where that steers you instead of what you are capable of or who God makes you. I think our own fear can run away with us and then become a thing we're so focused on that we're distracted. I know that it's easy for me to become totally distracted by other people's mistakes, even their blatant sinfulness. Like the impotent Skeletor, it's really easy for me to see other people doing something wrong and then become completely distracted from who God has made me and the goals God has for me because I'm worried about that person, their brokenness, or their issues. It's kind of a tricky thing, but you and I are part of a very consumer-driven society where everything is supposed to be, if we can just get that one more thing, we'll, we'll have things in order and we'll be happy and then there's another thing to buy. And this is a distraction. You and I can be distracted by our own sinfulness. Our own sinfulness leads us astray when we pay too much attention or buy too much into it and forget that you and I are children of God forgiven in Christ. There is this thing called Pelagianism, which is an ancient, very old theological heresy. And Pelagianism is a distraction. This is the belief that we can take care of ourselves, that we can pray hard enough or work hard enough or be good enough to take care of ourselves. And that is a weed sown amongst the grain of the creation and the part of creation that we live within. It isn't really about what we're capable of. It's about who is capable through us of such great things and moves us into uh, such an abundant field. Sometimes our work is a distraction, our school, or the issues of our work or our school or our schoolmates or our workmates. Our hobbies can be a distraction. Our own selves, our bodies can be a distraction. Uh, money and the pursuit of it, well, that can be a distraction too. Sometimes we uh, feel a little cynical, I feel cynical often, but negativity can be a distraction from the abundance that God plants. And you can become so focused on seeing things in that negative view that you don't see the stuff that God is up to and then you wonder where God is. We live in a culture of nihilism, nihilism being the belief that really it's all meaningless and there is no future and there is no eternity and there is no uh, thing beyond the moment so you know it's kind of this resigned feeling and that can be a distraction. Religion itself can be a distraction. If participating together in this video isn't a thing to, that we do to try to be uh, people for whom God speaks but instead we do this because it's a thing we're supposed to do, we could be distracted. Our destructive relationships can distract us. They can take us from uh, where deepening and holy and healthy uh, interactions might occur. 
this is the, the list that I made. Maybe the things on your list correspond to this, or maybe they don't. But these are the distractions that, that we face. These are the things that would so easily, uh, like the parable, take us away from residing and living and being the way that we should be. And then we become like the residents in that story. And for what? To what end? What is it that happens to us when the distractions become what defines us? Attention in those places and the places that you list as distraction or broken or sinful, attention in these places can be so destructive and we might be just going right along with it. It's as if we need saved. That these things are nefarious and they're nefarious because these things like weeds take us out of the line of salvation and of longevity and of purpose. They take us out of the system of grain and seed that produces grain and seed and 100% yield of, of the world around us. A story that goes from 25% to 100% growth, lineage, uh, improvement, connection with creation, all of which can only be won for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And we're taken out of it. And for what? What do we get for it? We are taken out of who God has made us in Christ for something that's the expedient, for the immediate, for one moment, and for its weeds. And this is not, and this should not, be who you are and who I am. And this is certainly not who Christ, who the manager of Kingdom of God Field, makes us, redeems us, and calls us to be. We are about more than the distractions. And this is a parable that asks the question of whether we can be called past them. So, in contrast to distraction and all the talk I've had about that for the last couple of minutes, in opposition to that, in holy, brave, filled with the Holy Spirit, called opposition to those distractions, what I want to see, and what I want to look for, and what I want to be about is the grain of God's kingdom. And so, just like we made a list about the distractions, I think the process here is to tear those up, burn them, destroy them, or let them set over on the side. And to think instead of the blessings or the opportunities, uh, the resources, the things God has given us, and the joy that we have experienced and can experience. The Bible, and in particular Jesus' parables, teach or they demonstrate they point to God's kingdom and to how God's kingdom works and they point to how faith in Christ leads us by God's Spirit to experience and to live and to thrive and these parables Jesus teachings Jesus word do this to us, they, they, they speak to us in two ways, in two directions. The first one, and these are the old Latin names, is via positiva, the positive way. It tells us, good job, look at that, uh, there's the thing that you want to do, uh, and that can be law too, but it tells us uh, there's the mountaintop, and it points us to it, and it even walks with us and strengthens us to get to it. That's one of the ways God's word works. The other way is the exact opposite. It's the via negativa. Again, that's Latin, the negative way. It shows what we're not supposed to do, and that would fit this parable, right? That this is a parable about how easily distracted the residents are, if you buy that, and I hope you do, because that's what I think this is about. And that is a parable that shows the via negativa, the negative way, the, the, the way uh, not to do it, the way to be taken, and how easy it is to be taken. And that's the point of this parable. It's about our awareness, and it is about the wherewithal that God gives us. It is about how easily distracted or waylaid we are, and it hopes to name that 
in order to help us identify it and to break or for God to break a deception. To me, this parable is a deception breaker. And so what we have here is this parable, this story, this word of God that is about our awareness. And it is about the wherewithal God gives you. And it comes at all of this from this other way. It depicts what distraction looks like and how silly it is. Uh, maybe that's that Skeletor reference, just silliness. And in that, it is a parable that follows the via negativa, pointing out what not to be and what not to do. And so to me, what the problem is, is even with the parable, how easy it is to do this and how often we become deceived. Even with the parable pointing this out, even with all this talk going into it, we still do this stuff. To me, what the problem that's being presented here is, and what we need Christ and the community of God's people that we gather together with to help us move away from, is just how often it happens. How often an enemy can take us from who we are and how often an enemy can block our enjoyment and our participation and keep us from really seeing just how wonderful God has made our lives to be and what God has won for us in Christ. So it's this via negativa, it's showing us what we would have to die to, and in this case it's dying to the distractions in order to be risen together with Christ. It's an awareness test. And just like that quip says, it is easy for us to miss something that we're not looking for. And so it tries to tell us to look. It tries to tell us that we are blessed and we have resources. And it asks us to look at them. And it asks us to look for who God makes us and for what God provides. It asks us to look for what opportunities or what good we do have that surrounds us and to occupy that field. To let the kingdom of God field and its manager, Christ himself, be our field and our way. To me, this is a parable about distraction. I hope by now that you buy that. And if it is, and if it comes at it from the via negativa, this is about being prayerful and moving away from the things that distract us that we listed, and instead opening up space, or having God open up space for us to live and to be and to become what God alone has won for us to be. And it's a field, and it's in God's hands, and God will take care of what God will take care of, and you and I are called to be its participants. Amen. Let's pray. Faithful God, it is you that is the most merciful judge, judge of all creation. We are reminded this morning that you care for your children with firmness and compassion, both at once. We are reminded that it is by your spirit that you nurture us and you guide us into the way to live in your kingdom. That by your spirit, we are rooted and we are rooted in the very way of your son, Jesus Christ, who is our savior and our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, whatever it is that may be a distraction, may you throw it aside and focus on some blessing or goodness, some work of God in your life today and this week. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.